So this is my dear friend Bob Fox, who I've known for, and, and for those of you who don't know him, I'm sorry, Ed Friedman and the chair of Friends of Mary Meany Bay. Um, I've known Bob for a, a good 30 years, really, most of the time I've been in Maine. Um, he's been a physician's assistant for like 40 years or so, and worked in different parts of that. He's currently working in the addiction, addiction field. And, uh, and then I don't know really how many years, five, six years, he really got into the, the 350.org and, and he's, he's become a really superb organizer. I've seen him on video, so I can attest to it. Yeah, so they can look for him on, on Bath and Brunswick cable TV and wherever, you know. So, and YouTube, again. So. Yeah. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I, I was up at the Climate Solutions event last Wednesday in Augusta when the weather hit and was disappointed that we weren't, weren't able to do this, but I'm glad we're here tonight. Let me see how this uh, remote works. And the tar sands oil is the focus of this, but it's going to go beyond that. So we'll get into some different issues as we go along. This is a picture many of you who, who know about the tar sands have probably seen along the way. But there are many people who don't realize that there's this huge industrial tar sands activity up in Alberta at Fort McMurray. And then there are... Um, pipelines that come all the way across the country uh, and they have just now had approval for this part of Enbridge Line 9. Line 9A got approved about a year ago and they just approved Line B to bring it to Montreal. So this pipeline has been around for many, many decades, but our concern here in Portland has been now for a couple of years that once they actually bring it to Montreal, that they'll be able to bring it down uh, into Portland. And the reason is, and we'll get into this in a little bit more, is there is an existing pipeline, uh, sections of it are 70 year, approaching 70 years of age, that tankers come into South Portland and then pump oil up to Montreal. This goes back to World War II when um, Nazis were actually blockading uh, Canada in terms of getting oil. So we helped them get around that by building this pipeline up to Montreal. Um, so it's, it's had a function and a value for, for many decades, uh, but we now have concern that there's very strong evidence that this tar sands oil will be moved to Montreal and then down into the greater Portland area. And there's a reason that matters to the Friends of Mary Meeting Bay, and we're gonna, we're gonna get into that. Um, this is also something that a lot of people don't know, which is that there are dozens of pipelines across the country. It's a literal spider web. Uh, and many of us have heard about the Keystone XL pipeline. There's a number of other pipelines that have made the news, but there's the ones we don't hear about. But this is the nature of our uh, fossil fuel industry is, is it gets moved in all kinds of ways, but pipelines uh, uh, are an enormous part of that. And it's more than just pipelines. It's the fossil fuel industry overall. Our concern uh, from a 350 perspective are these things that we call extreme energy, which includes tar sands oil, fracked oil and gas, and coal. So when I say pipe tar sands oil and beyond, these are things that we have to be attentive to as well. So just to give you a sense of where we're going tonight, uh, introductions about me, you, and us, and how we do this together, who 350 and 350 Maine are. Uh, just a little share about my perspective on this with regard to possibility, solidarity, and gratitude. I'll speak to that, and you even get to find out what the meaning of life is before we're done. Um, then we start to talk about the local aspects and connecting it to, to how it affects all of us here in Maine, including the global and the local risks. And because it can start to feel a little bit like a bummer, uh, we really want to continue to focus on solutions versus just constantly focusing on the negative and the pollution concerns. So, question, how many people have heard of 350.org? We want to be below 350 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, as of this spring, we hit 400. What we know is that above 350, and again, this is the 97% of scientists agree that once you get above this number, um, that's when these extreme weather events uh, occur, uh, the Katrinas and so forth, and the challenges that we've been seeing and the melting of the ice caps, as, as Bill McKibben of 350 says, we have actually destroyed a major physical structure on our planet uh, through the choices that we've been making of putting this carbon into the atmosphere. 
350 Maine is an effort to bring this knowledge and this uh, motivation for change into, into Maine. And I, I want to tell you a little bit about it. But for me, the, the things that get me through the day in, in my organizing are committing to the issue of possibility, really being grateful again for you guys for all the work you do with Friends of Mary Meeting Bay and coming out tonight, and the importance of solidarity. As uh, again, as has been pointed out, we're going up against the most profitable industry in history. And the currency that we have is each other. And so, you know, there's just no way that we're going to win through the money game. Uh, but the good news is this grassroots effort that's very much a part of the 350 Maine has, has been incredibly successful. Um, for me, the possibility of going from just a normal guy in the world doing my job uh, as a healthcare provider, again, I'm a physician assistant, but I've always been interested in the environment. Um, but for most of my life, I was what I call a clicktivist, which was I sit behind my computer clicking computer keys to do petitions and so forth. Um, and I also had uh, real success as a complainivist. I was the smartest guy in the room that complained that everybody else was doing it wrong. Um, we still have those in our solidarity, and they have their value because they get to remind us. Um, but there's a broad spectrum of different types of a vist. And, and I'm excited to have uh, you know worked with all kinds of different styles. In the past, my experience was uh, you know supporting Amnesty the International, working with Occupy uh, in Portland, uh, but I got really inspired by 350.org uh, when I was down, when 12,000 of us circled the White House back in 2011. And from there, that's when I uh, came home and realized I needed to work with others to make this grow. I couldn't do this on my own, and I have a story I'll share with you um, that relates to the two's a group, three's a crowd. Um, but we can't do this alone, and I oftentimes have people, people will ask me, what is it that we can do to make a difference? And my overall response is do whatever you can and maybe a little bit more. We, we all need to nudge ourselves and each other uh, a bit more. But we also have to be careful. This is a title of a program that I teach on occasion called The Wellness and the Activist. And I made a joke for the longest time that I was going to put this program on, but no one would come because they were too busy. Uh, and in fact, that's been the case. It's, it's challenging to get that, that class going because people are just so busy. But the burnout risk is enormous. And so you know, solidarity is more than just us showing up to everything. We also have to support each other and take care of ourselves so that we can stay healthy and actually uh, do what it takes. So the meaning of life, this came to me uh, when I was very young. And I, I, I'm, we could poll the room as to what your opinion of the meaning of life is. But I'm just going to suggest that it's about learning. Uh, it's the kind of experience that we're doing here tonight. It's the kind of experience that is our lifelong process to learn more and more. And I truly believe that life is wonderful. It's also very difficult. I was talking with a librarian when we were trying to sort this out, and that's the first line from M. Scott Peck's The, L the Road Less Traveled. Life is difficult, and it is. But it also is truly full of wonder. And part of the reason I wear this shirt um, is to remind myself of that. And, and there's more detail, there's more story to that I can tell you later. But for me, this is to remind myself that I can choose to view life as miserable and frustrating, or I can choose to commit to joy. And that's, again, for me, what this learning has brought me to is to try to work towards possibility, anything's possible, work with others, and to do it with hope and joy and to be as positive as possible. Because again, there's a lot of really challenging things that we're up against, and this tar sands thing uh, is, is a big example of that. So 350 Maine has, I think, had all of these components. And this is the part that I'm going to move through fairly quickly. Um, it started in, in the early uh, phases. You would see people making these kind of representations of the number 350. Uh, originally, it was uh, students at um, in uh, Vermont working with Bill McKibben, who was their instructor. And they uh, realized that it would be smart to use a number, because that's the universal language, versus having to translate it from country to country, because they wanted this to be a global effort. And they've done very creative activities across the world uh, to try to get people engaged on this. 
There have been the notable things of people getting arrested, uh, and, and there's more of that activity coming our way. This is one of our co-founders of 350 Maine uh, down, I think it was October of 2011. That's Heidi Brueger and then Bill McKibben uh, getting arrested down at the White House to make the point. Uh, and this was, a, um, this was a pipeline arrest, actually. Um, this is me by myself, like a crazy fool, on the uh, Casco Bay Bridge. Mm -hmm. There was events that they called us to, 350, um, called Blow the Whistle. And it was blowing the whistle on the connection between the oil industry and Congress. And we were wearing referee shirts. I was the only joker who showed up to this event. <laughs> and and a, a couple things I learned is if you're going to blow a whistle like that all the time, you need to wear earplugs. Because after about eight minutes, I was deaf. Um, but there's a video I have of this where I set up a camera and just shot it thinking other people were going to show up. And what ended up happening was this great, wonderful possibility, which was people were just blowing by me. Maybe some would go home and wonder what 350 was and look it up. But I'd been out there probably 40 minutes, and the bridge went up. So now I've got a captive audience. And what goes by? An oil tanker, which just made it even more poetic. And it was 54 degrees on January the 24th. Um, and it just really kind of brought it all together that I was, in fact, doing the right thing, though now deaf. Um, but I also committed that I would never be the only person at one of these events again. That's, that's when I came up with, people would always say, how many people are coming to your event? And I'm like, just more than me. That's all I care about. And it's really been growing ever since. So that the next blow of the whistle event that uh, 350 called a month later, there was 12 of us down in Portland. This is a friend of mine, Hillary uh, Clark from York, who um, came up to me and said, who the hell are you? <laughs> and we've kind of been saying that to each other ever since and trying to figure out how to work together. So point is, we kept moving through these events, not quite sure how it was going to go, who was going to show up. These connect the dots events that ended up going all across the state. Now it's more than just me. Now it's more than just two of us. Now it's many of us. And this is the way the movement has grown as we've continued to go to uh, a statewide meeting. This is actually about half the crowd because people had already cleared out by the time we got to the picture. And we then moved on to the do the math. Now again, we're all weaving through this is tar sands. And we're going to get to the very specific things about tar sands, specifically regarding the Androscoggin. Um, but a couple questions. How many people went to the do the math event? Okay. How many people heard about the do the math event? Good. All right. Thank you. This was a 20 city tour across the country about climate change and the impact of carbon and the finances and the economics of it, et cetera. Um, again, I'll tell you some more. I'm just showing you this slide to show you this slide to make the point that we in Maine were never on the list to be one of the stops. And we had the audacity to do exactly what 350 does, which was to file a petition that they should bring it to Portland, Maine. They wanted to take it to Burlington. And we were actually able to bring it and sell out the State Theater in Portland. Again, in terms of possibility, in terms of solidarity, working together, we made something that was not going to happen. I mean, they literally told, I talked directly to Bill McKibben, and he says, yeah, we're just not going to be able to do it. And then in November of 2012, we sold out the, the uh, State Theater. We then rolled into the beginning of January. This is Jan uh, 2013, January 26, 2013. This was the day of action in Portland. Anybody attend that? And, <laughs> and Ed raises his hand because here is his helicopter. We, we had a goal to take this on by land, sea, and air. And we had, uh, I don't even remember the number now, but it was, I believe, 1,500 people marched from Monument Square in Portland down to the pier. Uh, and we had a person with a banner on the ferry as it took off, and we had Ed dropping a banner out of the helico helicopter. Uh, it was an incredible event. We brought people from all across New England, um, and once again, we just took something that was just an idea, and it became even bigger. We then went down to Washington, D.C. This is the Ford on Climate, when 50,000 people uh, marched on D.C. to protest uh, the Keystone XL pipeline. 
We had buses that went down. We tried to carpool to reduce our carbon impact. And we just continued rolling through the summer into our second statewide meeting. There's been a huge effort around divestment from fossil fuel uh, industries. Again, that's its own lecture. Um, and we then went into a summer heat event up in Sebago Lake with a lot of street theater. What 350 is known for is a lot of street theater creative activities. And uh, we got a lot of attention, a lot of people engaged. We then had a, a big action at a coal plant in Brayton Point in Massachusetts. And actually, that coal plant is now shutting down. And there's evidence it was because of our protest. I apologize, this picture is so bad. Um, we also have had a, a, a train blockade, which you may have heard of in the news. Um, the first one was in Fairfield, which was about 10 days before the Lac Megantic explosion. And we were protesting the Lac Megantic possibility. And um, we then also had a follow-up blockade in Auburn. And these are you know, groups of people from all over the state who are willing to do nonviolent civil disobedience to try to, number one, educate and inform and engage people, uh, but also to try to make changes that we're not engaged with this extreme energy. Moving, we're almost there. This was the beginning of this year. We had an event called Tar Sands Exposed, which was a Tar Sands speakers tour where we uh, managed 10 stops across the Northeast, including Montreal. Garth Lenz is a, a renowned environmental photographer who um, has had photos with all kinds of places, including National Geographic, and some of his photos uh, I'm sure you've seen. Crystal Lehman and Ariel Duranger are from First Nations living in the Alberta tar sands area. And they came and just made it very personal and very powerful as to what uh, they confront every day uh, living in the world of tar sands up in Alberta. Um, we had, again, a great team working on this. This was uh, Eben Rose, uh, we refer to as Eben Almighty, did all, all of our artwork. And again, we moved, we had two stops in Vermont, two in New Hampshire, two in Mass, one in Montreal, two in Portland, and one up in Orono. Anybody able to attend that at all? Powerful? This is on, or any of this stuff is on our website, including the video of the Portland event and also the Orono event. Um, but it, it was an attempt to try to make the connection uh, from where this stuff comes from there uh, to here. And then this was an event in uh, Washington, D.C. that just occurred where over a thousand students pr predominantly marched from Georgetown University, stopped in front of uh, uh, Secretary of State Kerry's home and performed a protest. Uh, because he has some deciding on the Keystone XL. And then we, uh, then people marched to the White House where over 300 and some students were arrested in protest of the Keystone. Most recently, just last week, we had this climate solutions event, uh, which, anybody able to attend that? I mean, even with the weather, the turnout was quite incredible. And the really notable thing, that was they, they brought a lot of young people and it was really quite powerful. So we're trying to stay fluid and flexible and responsive. Um, this really isn't a pitch for 350. It's really uh, letting you know that there are those kind of opportunities out there, but it's about us working together. And we work with larger teams. We have very close relationships with NRCM, Sierra Club, um, Environment Maine, Food and Water Watch, uh, Green Initiatives, developing relationship with Friends of Mary Media Bay, because that's the only way we're going to solve these problems that we're, that we're confronting. And I'll get into this in terms of some stuff that is next, um, but, but we are moving more and more into direct action, non-civil, uh, non-violent civil disobedience. Um, and it, it's really about finding people what they're passionate about and how they can engage around this. But it is about local, and you guys know that from your own work. This is a picture of uh, the South Portland Gymnasium that filled up uh, back in the spring as we were taking on the issue of tar sands possibly coming into South Portland. And the relationship building has been enormous. There's nothing more local than climate change. 
Um, but we also have to be careful to not get too caught up in the not in my backyard stuff, which again, for me, takes us back to there's nothing more local than climate change. And it's all connected. We have these issues across the state. This is the, the name that we've branded the Portland-Montreal pipeline, that one that comes from, from now from Port, South Portland up to Montreal. It's 72% owned by ExxonMobil. Uh, and Suncor is the other company. So we, we refer to it as the ExxonMobil pipeline. There's concerns about the East-West Corridor. People familiar with East-West Corridor? Good. Oh, that's actually good to see. Okay. Um, the Sierra Sport LPG tank issue was a tremendous success. Um, the issues of waste disposal and a particular frightening one with the mountaintop removal. So these things are all connected, including just the industry coming in and uh, taking, trying to take advantage at times of, of uh, as they say with the East-West Corridor, the, uh, what is the phrase for the the empty middle, or there's another phrase I'm not remembering. That, but, but the Chinbro guy has referred to that area as basically, why can't we take it? It really doesn't have any value. Um, and then the issue of, again, how big is your backyard in terms of we have a coal plant down in Elliott, uh, or sorry, down in uh, Portsmouth area. The natural gas thing, the myth of natural gas being free uh, or inexpensive and clean, which it's really neither. Uh, the concern that's growing about tar sands being in our gasoline, and there's some information from NRDC over there. It's not a significant issue at this point in this state. Uh, and these other pressures, uh, including the Canadian pressure to move this tar sands down into our area. But there are lots of solutions. We're not going to talk at length about them tonight unless there's time and people want to share their experience. Uh, but all evidence is that despite what you may have seen from Mr. LePage today, a, a green economy is truly possible. So this is one of Garth's pictures. This is, if this was a medical procedure, taking this pristine boreal forest to this disaster, this would be malpractice. This is what they do up in Alberta. They, they take what is felt to be an enormous area of retaining carbon, what they call a carbon sink, and they clear cut it, and they destroy it, and they put these uh, dirt highways to move their trucks, uh, and these tailing ponds of waste that birds, when they land on it, actually die. This is, this is the kind of stuff for those who, who came to the Tar Sands Exposed, we get into more detail about what this is really all about. Have people seen this picture before or something like it? Uh, it's, it doesn't get any better. It's never, you can see it a dozen times. The sources of Tar Sands are Alberta, Venezuela, Russia, and as some of you may have seen from the news, there's a huge deposit out in Utah, uh, which they have been buying up land and are looking to start developing that as well. Um, the pipelines that move it, again, the Keystone XL is the one that, uh, again, I don't want to rehash stuff that people know. People know what the Keystone P pipeline is? OK. Um, what we're up against, the reason that there's so much energy around uh, the Keystone, up into including uh, civil disobedience is because that last northern section that comes across the Canadian border into the U.S. is pending approval by the Secretary of State and President Obama. And so we have asked them to not approve it. As some of you may be aware, there was a, um, uh, there was a report out from the State Department that, that basically supported the Keystone uh, being fully developed. And that will then move the tar sands from Alberta right down to the Gulf. Which reminds me to mention, as many of you may know, this stuff isn't coming to us. There's all this talk about uh, how it's going to reduce our costs. Uh, there will be jobs, but they're very limited. Uh, but this stuff is going overseas. China and India seem to be the, uh, the places that it's going to. So they're moving this stuff. It's landlocked in Alberta, 
activists successfully blocked it going out of British Columbia, uh, and now they're trying to find whatever ways they can, they can get it out to the market. Um, so the Keystone XL has tremendous power as a, as a symbol uh, for us with our activism in terms of whether we can have success with this. But we also are quite anxious um, that, it, that all, there's a great deal of evidence that suggests it's going to be uh, approved. Um, the Portland-Montreal pipeline, which again is our backyard in particular, uh, as many of you may know, and I'll, I'll get into some more details here in a bit, for many years, the Portland-Montreal Pipeline Company had an active request uh, for infrastructure development in South Portland that would only exist if they were planning on reversing the pipeline and bringing the tar sands down into Portland. A number of players got wind of this and started pushing back, and that was what led to the ordinance uh, of last year to say that they could not bring tar sands. Now, there's been all kinds, we're not going to get into the debate and the language and the opinion about it, but um, the unfortunate reality was is that ordinance did not succeed at the polls. Um, but the next day, uh, to their credit, the city councilors of South Portland um, put a uh, started the process for a moratorium on tar sands coming into South Portland. Uh, and it actually looks like they're going to extend that again. Um, but, but a big part of why we're talking tonight is the risk that ExxonMobil, the Portland Montreal Pipeline Company, have shown their hand that they had the intent to move this, uh, have now withdrawn that. But they also continue to have propaganda that they're generating that says there's really nothing wrong with tar sands. And uh, it's, it's been a very complex process. But again, tremendous success in, in terms of responding to that. You also probably heard of the Mayflower incident in Mayflower, Arkansas, when a um, pipeline burst in a neighborhood very similar to South Portland, uh, a pipeline of the same age. Uh, not on this list uh, is the Kalamazoo, which I think we're coming up to our third anniversary. That was 17 hours of this stuff being pumped by a company that claimed that they monitored and the safety uh, precautions were uh, tremendous, and they ignored the readings, and this stuff continued to, to um, pump into a tributary that then feeds into the, the Kalamazoo. The one that's also concerning is this one called Energy East. People heard about Energy East? What, what we've had concern about was that stuff would come down to South Portland. There was also some significant concern that it would go through the middle of Maine along the east-west corridor, potentially. But there's some evidence that we've had success because if you look at the map, and I'm sorry I don't have it, of the Energy East pipeline, which has been proposed by TransCanada, the same company who's, who's uh, behind um, the Keystone XL, is it goes right over Maine. So they're trying to bring through their own pipeline. They're actually in competition. So this is TransCanada, who's the company with Keystone, in competition with Enbridge. Enbridge has had approval to start bringing it to Montreal. These guys are going to build a $15 billion pipeline that's going to bring tar sands from the west, and it actually goes up over Maine and comes out of New Brunswick. There's a big relationship with Irving Oil and so forth. So again, that map that already was a spider web is getting even more webby, uh, and the, the competition and the costs associated with it are enormous. So this is what tar sands looks like uh, when you bring it up out of the ground. Uh, and the challenge is bringing it up out of the ground. There's a lot of debate about, do you call it tar sands? Do you call it oil sands? I'm going to go with the Wikipedia definition for now. Um, bitumen is the, the, the technical term that's felt to be the most accurate. Um, but it's basically loose sand. Uh, or, as it says, consolidated sandstone containing mixtures of sand, clay, and water saturated with a dense and extremely viscous form of petroleum. So 
what it takes to get that out of the ground is that ugly picture I showed you before of clear cutting and uh, there's two types of mining that they do. Uh, one where they drill down into the ground from the surface and another where um, they put pipes down and, and access it that way. Um, I don't know all the technical aspects of it, but either it all adds up to ugliness. Um, and the concerns are the impacts of the extraction. You have enormous amounts of water that is used to make this happen, which then leads to an enormous amount of wastewater. These are these tailing ponds that I was mentioning. Uh, you use a great deal of natural gas and other energy to make this happen. This is one of those crazy things where the economics of it allows you to spend all this money to, in energy to get energy. Uh, and the market could shift in a moment and suddenly it's not all that profitable, but right now it's felt profitable even when you put uh, all of this into it. The tailing ponds and these things called diluents which are chemicals, uh, and again, I have a slide later on that refers to some of it, that have to be used to dilute out that clump of bitumen uh, so that it can actually move through a pipeline. And that's one of our biggest concerns is that when they, they use all of these chemicals to soften this stuff up, uh, when a pipeline spills, the petroleum is one concern, uh, but it's all this other uh, benzene and all these other toxins that have been used to dilute it out. And that's, you know, that's when the spill impacts kick in with uh, their impacts on the air, the soil, and the water, which will, as proven with the Kalamazoo, will never go away. Now Enbridge, who was again the company uh, responsible for that particular pipeline spill, they've said they're all done. It's all cleaned up. Uh, but, you know, people are still sick, people still cannot go into their home, the river will never be cleaned. You may have also seen with the Mayflower, Arkansas uh, event, really scary stuff. Like, they, ExxonMobil was able to control a no-fly over zone of that spill, that people, that press was not allowed to actually see it, and their most effective initial response to it was to give people paper towels to clean up this, this oil spill in their neighborhood. Um, and again, we've seen it repeatedly, including with the BP oil spill, all as well. And then, then there's the, the rest of the story, including the propaganda that we have to confront, including this issue of reclamation. This just came out, sorry this doesn't show up too well. Again, this is from the um, American Petroleum Institute. Uh, they, they've got this group they call Energy Citizens, but it's really paid for by American Petroleum Institute. And they have started putting these ads in all the South Portland uh, newspapers. Now, they've said through their relationship with Portland Pipeline that they don't plan to bring tar sands into the city. Why are they trying to reassure us that Canadian oil sands are really no, nothing to worry about? It's just oil from Canada. Um, and so this is the kind of very expensive expensive propaganda, it's, we know they spent at least $700,000 in that campaign over the summer and into the fall to shut down the ordinance. And I still believe it had to approach a million bucks uh, because of how hard they worked. And the disinformation that, that went out was just incredible. And they're still up to it. Um, we've had some creative friends in our groups uh, particularly with the group in South Portland called Protect South Portland, who make the point that you can always call it something else. You know, it, it's, it, you know, it's just tar sands or just oil. Well, it's also just PR, once again, from big oil. And, and it, it's, it's amazing how effective their, their PR is, but um, that's, they, they've been doing it for lots of years. Here's another... Um, example of their PR, which again, I just can't imagine works. They have signed contracts that they will reclaim land um, from its original state once they have used it to access and gather up tar sands. And this is what they consider to be reclaimed. Now again, I'm sorry, the picture's not the greatest, but I think even with that, you can see that that is not that and never will be. But this is language in the contract that they consider this to be equivalent land use capacity. That that is the same biologically and otherwise as that. 
So I don't think that's returning something to its former better state or even close. But th this is the kind of stuff that they turn to the First Nations and say, we'll take it back to what it was. So I'm going to give you a very short review of the do the math that Bill McKibben did for an hour and a half in South Portland, um, in Portland at the State Theater. And, and this reinforces why we are so focused on uh, tar sands as an extreme energy uh, issue specific to climate change, um, and why we call Alberta tar sands a carbon bomb. You know, it's worse than a nuclear bomb. It, it will destroy the, the uh, planet. Uh, and that's just the Alberta tar sands. And, and so that's why so much energy has been spent on trying to, to keep in the ground what's supposed to be in the ground. Um, because what we know is we've already had a one degree rise with, with that, um, with the carbon being over 350 parts per million, we've already had a one degree rise in our uh, cent centigrade, one degree centigrade rise in our global temperatures. And what we're concerned about is that if you put out 565 gigatons of carbon, that will take us to two degrees of a rise, which we cannot survive. It, it is catastrophic. Um, now, if you notice, I haven't spent a lot of time uh, debating whether climate change is real or not, because there's no debate. I mean, there's just no debate. I'm happy to chat with anybody about it, but it, it's just, it's a waste of time to not, uh, to, to not accept that. And fortunately, more and more uh, politicians, still behind the curve, are, are accepting it, and, um, and more and more of the public. And you can debate the science because it's developing about this, you know, what's it going to take to push us over to? But that's the direction we're going in. And because if, if the Alberta tar sands was fully uh, accessed as they intend to, um, that would equal 240 gigatons. That's why we spend so much time because that's such a significant amount of this uh, 565 gigatons that we cannot afford. Yes, sir. And that the point of the do the math uh, exercise that, that McKibben and 350 were doing is that that 565 is a number we do not want to go over in terms of gigatons accessed. But what the fossil fuel corporations have in their reserves is 2,795, five times that. So even putting our limit on the Keystone XL is somewhat pointless, uh, it feels at times, because these co corporations, their job is to access their reserves and to make use of them. And, and they're beholden to their, uh, to, the, you know, to their investors to actually access this. So, you know, that, I mean, what's five times a catastro catastrophe? I mean, what, what, what's five times an unlivable planet? Um, so that's why, uh, again, both from an informative point of view, uh, an, a motivating point of view, and we just cannot afford to do it. There's been so much focus on the Keystone XL. Um, and I realize we started late. I want to get to this before I lose some of you. Here's our spider web again. Here's our pipeline. Here's, again, a big part of why we're here is the Androscoggin River. The pipeline crosses uh, the Androscoggin, the Crooked. There's a long list. But this pipeline starting up in Vermont at the Canadian border and coming down. Um, and now I've brought you to Berlin, New Hampshire, and into Maine. And I'm taking you now north of Berlin to the source of the Androscoggin. Is it Umbagog? OK. Uh, and that then, the river begins coming down this way and continues. Again, there's Umbagog? Umbagog. Um, Umbagog, OK. Uh, coming down to Berlin. And then we have the river coming here, and here's the pipeline. The red is the pipeline. So the, the pipeline's coming ac across New Hampshire, 
towards Berlin, over to Bethel. So it joins the valley of the Inscog and Nicole. Yeah. And I get it a little closer there. So here it is coming down here, and it just is right next to it. Now, again, from an engineering point of view, you kind of get why they did that 70 years ago. It's insane now <laughs> that, that you would put a, a pipeline with a fossil fuel right on a water source. Um, but, and I don't know, somebody else may know the distance, but in that, you know, that, that's a lot of miles of potential spills. The new Keystone XL pipeline in its first year spilled 17 times, the new one. Uh, and the, one of the scary things about spills and other issues with, with these pipelines is that there, as you know how the game works, there's a threshold, a reporting threshold, so they can have a spill, but if it didn't hit a certain level, they don't have to report it. So we don't really even know how many times these things spill. Uh, so now the Androscoggin continues uh, east, and the pipeline starts heading down towards South Portland, so they split there. And again, pipeline still over here, and now the Androscoggin is over to Leeds, that area, that's this one. So this is it here, coming down here. Um, and again, the Androscoggin continuing over to Lewiston, so we've got the distance here to the red pipeline, and then finally the Androscoggin coming down to Mary Meeting Bay from Lewiston right there. So point is, the, the biggest risk is up north, as you saw, but it, it's a huge risk. Um, one of the things that was concerning when we were speaking with the Portland Water District, as you know, Sebago Lake is the water for 20 some percent of Maine. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's been of value is the Portland Water District is now looking at the craziness of, a, of any fossil fuel going by Sebago Lake. I mean, if you've been out there, you can see the yellow posts that show you how close this pipeline comes to Sebago Lake. Can you take that back one slide and then get up Sebago in the last slide? Yeah. So in this Raymond connection, it, they, there are literally places where it goes under uh, the, the uh, pipeline goes under the lake. And what, um, again, we don't want it to be unscientific, but it's also concerning that the, when the Portland Montreal Pipeline Company did their presentation to the Portland Water District, uh, the outlet for Sebago Lake is down here in the southeast. And uh, what they said was that the topography of the, you know, the floor of the lake and the flow of the lake would actually is counterclockwise. And so that if there was a spill here, it would, it would go counterclockwise. And by the time it ever got to the outlet, it would be so diluted out, it wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> They actually said that. No, they actually, and I, I wish I had, I, I don't know the topography of it, but there apparently is an elevation under there, and they actually said that will stop, the majority of the oil will come in contact with that elevation, and, and then because of the counterclockwise. Again, to me, there's a difference between science and common sense in this case. I mean, I really do want to rely on science, but that's just this crazy talk, which we all seem to have reacted as if we agree, yes. I, I think Sebago is one of few lakes in the whole country that don't have to filter their water because it's that clean. And to build a filtration uh, plant is, I think, like $50 million, I think is the number I've seen. Um, so people are willing to take a risk to that kind of potential cost, which is, so, again, there's other qualities of this that come up. You'll hear all kinds of debate. The, the, uh, uh, the, the concern, which seems to be legitimate science, is that this stuff, the diluted bitumen, sinks. And so all of the stuff that we do to attend to a traditional oil spill in terms of oil that would stay on the surface, skimming and you know protecting it in that way just does not apply in this case and so um, you know when you look at what they have for preparation to respond to this it, it's in, it's ineffective 
I mean, it's arguably ineffective anyway <laughs> in terms of how much you really can clean up. But with this particular issue, it's particularly ineffective. Yeah. There's no recommended daily allowance for uh, petrochemicals. <laughs> so that's our view. The challenge is when you go into these public forums, they say none of that is true. It's not more corrosive. It's not under higher temperature. It's not under higher pressure. It's just you and I won't argue that. So. <laughs> Um, so again, this is the end point of, or the beginning point of the pipeline in South Portland. If you know South Portland at all, um, Southern Maine Medical, uh, Southern uh, Maine Community College is to your right. Joe's Boathouse, nice little restaurants right here. Uh, Bug lights to your left. We see these tankers come up. I, I think I'm accurate that the number of tanks in South Portland, I live in South Portland, is 300. It's amazing that there's that many there. And, and I, like many, miss it. So I would see this tanker pull up, and I had no connection to what was going on. But the concern is that this pipeline, which now goes up to Montreal, would be reversed. And this is pictures that the Portland-Montreal pipeline developed in their application for reversal of, if you see in the upper right, I'll give you a better picture in a minute, proposed VCUs unloading arms and widening uh, with additional pilings to be able to take on uh, tankers that would be needed to offload tar sands oil into. These vapor combustion units, 70 foot chimneys, two of them, uh, which interestingly, I like the vapor combustion unit thing. I don't know why they don't just call it pollution chimneys, but it sounds nicer to call them va vapor combustion units. Um, but these were in their own application, um, which they now have denied that they had any intent, nor do they have any intent in the future. So call it vapors, that's kind of nice, uh, but it's really actually pollution. And that's what has to be bled out of the petroleum um, based product before it's loaded on ships, otherwise Correct, and all those things that di dilute the those chemicals have to be burned off, and that then goes into the air, and we breathe it in, but it's just vapors. Yeah, and when you look at the air quality in South Portland now, again, somebody who's more familiar with this can speak to it in numbers and so forth, but it's not good as it is because of the petroleum industry, and it would uh, increase that pollutant level dramatically. But it's within DEP limits, so it's okay to work together because these things do spill. This was the pipeline rupture for Kalamazoo, um, that 17 hour spill that I mentioned. Um, and we've had them just constantly, I make the joke that the way the Portland Pipeline Company presents themselves, if they had been put in charge of the BP oil spill, they would have solved it in a day or so because there's just really no trouble. Which reminds me of another quick story. Uh, we happened to be online one day and noticed on the South Portland website that the, listed on the very first page was uh, oil pipeline incident. So we started asking questions. What, what is that? It literally took us four days to get an answer, and we're still not sure we got the answer. Um, but we would call the South Portland City office and they would send us to the Portland Pipeline Company. The Portland Pipeline Company said that it was a um, Portland Water District issue. Portland Water District sent us to the police department, sent us back to, the, it just went round and round and round and round. Now this is in the context of the Portland Pipeline Company saying they were gonna be fully transparent and if anybody had a question, da, 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 they would answer it. And ultimately, four days later, someone, I think it was with the, pipe, uh, with the Water District said, there had been an excavator that nicked the outside of a pipeline, an oil pipeline. We don't know what's true. <laughs> and that, again, the, the inability, they, the, their major argument so far in these public debates is that they have been a good neighbor. They are a major taxpayer in South Portland. They have done great work uh, for a, a service that is, in our view, in 350, past its time. We need to move past fossil fuels. We'd like to see solar panels on all those 300 oil tanks down there. But it's going to be a transition. But, but we're very concerned that they continue to present themselves as a good neighbor, and then there's all the rest of what happens. So the impacts locally are significant. We've got um, not on this list is the ballast issue, you know, bringing tankers into, into uh, South Portland area, Greater Portland, Casco Bay. Um, and as was already acknowledged, 
there ain't nothing healthy about petrochemicals. They are a known carcinogen. Um, they have a clear and adverse effect on human health. And there's strong evidence that uh, tar sands is particularly toxic. So pick an organ system. I know as a medical provider, all these organ systems and more get affected by uh, petrochemicals. Uh, some of the worst disease I've seen, including an addiction or these poor people who you know what huffing is when people inhale or back in the old days when kids would sniff glue and stuff like that? What that does is melt brain cells, it literally melts them. They don't come back. And, and some of the worst conditions I've seen. So this is the kind of stuff we're being exposed to. The natural gas condensate used to dilute tar sands increases the risk that, it, that you'll have explosions. The uh, benzene, hexane, and other hydrocarbons affect the central nervous system. And the bitumen um, don't, uh, the dilutants evaporate, but the bitumen goes to the bottom. Uh, so again, part of what the, the um, Portland Pipeline Company was saying to the Portland Water District was, this stuff will evaporate off, no big deal. And this stuff will just go to the bottom and it'll never get in the water system. I don't know that I believe that. You had a question? And do they tell us what the diluents are? No, that's, of course, uh, what's the word when it's a trade secret? Trade secret yeah. Proprietary, yeah. And so even if something is typically volatile, if it's soluble in water, the water solubility is going to keep it from volatilizing. Right, so right. Fine. And then there's that. And we know those things are in there, but yeah, we don't know the details from there. So again, there's nothing more local in climate change. This issue with tar sands very directly relates for the reasons that we've considered. Um, what we found through the tar sands exposed tour was that when we looked closer at these connections and these relationships, I mean, a big part of this uh, was us raising funds for these First Nations people who are up in Alberta, have had their land taken away from them, have had their treaty rights denied, and they don't have the money to take the Canadian government to court. So when we asked them, how can we help you, uh, help us to get this word out, they said, we just need money for our legal uh, case. Uh, so again, the, the connections to all of this go obviously far past Alberta and far past South Portland and far past the Androscoggin. Um, but for me, it's, we all need to be reminded, you know, these kind of opportunities help us. Taking care of ourselves, I view my activism as a, as a spiritual practice, and as I said, rather than fall prey to fear and, and being overwhelmed by how intimidating this can be, I really try to commit to joy and uh, work with people with that energy. and. And then we can bitch and moan other days, too. Uh, but it's, it's helping all of us to wake up to this. And also, as a friend of mine, David Stember from 350, um, uh, he started 350 Vermont, and he's now on the Tar Sands team for 350.org. He just regularly says to me, are you having fun? <laughs> and I find myself saying, not so much, a little too much. And he just reminds me that you know this is, again, the part of the solidarity is to stay committed to the learning and stay committed to having fun with it. So there's, again, ways that you can be involved. Uh, there's a lot to say about the civil disobedience uh, part of 350's activities. But again, as identified in the Do the Math Tour and through other events, we feel that this is the moral crisis of our time. And without any disrespect, we uh, are taking this on as if it were a civil rights issue. And, and making use of what has a, a worked Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King to actually be willing to say, we will do what's viewed as an illegal act to point out how unjust this is. And so that's why you see people who have chosen to be arrested and people who will choose to be arrested once again on April the 27th in Washington, DC. There is a group, I love this name, the Cowboy Indian Alliance. <laughs> which is a group of uh, Native Americans out west and ranchers who are protesting the Keystone XL going through their territory. And they are having a week-long protest around this uh, leading up to April 27th, at which point buses are going to converge on Washington, D.C. and 
hundreds if not thousands of people will be willing to be arrested in protest. There also is the Credo Pledge, which some of you may have heard of. Anybody? There's information over here, but it's again a very specific Keystone XL um, protest where 86,000 people across the country have committed a willingness to be arrested in protest to the Keystone XL pipeline. I don't know where they're going to put 86,000 people. But to me, as a person who's not made the choice to be arrested, for people to have that level of commitment and that level of courage and, and the potential of that getting people's attention, I, I think it's enormous. Um, and there is very real fear that, that President Obama is, gonna, uh, is going to uh, agree to this Keystone XL. So the point is, there's training across the state for the Credo Pledge. Uh, the information handout will help, and our website will have information. You do not have to uh, agree to be arrested. You can be part of the support team, or you can just be supporting the effort. Um, but it, it's a real way to get directly involved. You want to make any comment? Major investor. TD Bank, if you go onto their website, it, it says that they are a major investor and supporter of the development of pipelines. Uh, and they, yes, TD is, uh, what's the T part? Toronto. Toronto Dominion, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we have two big companies, Canada based companies, that are concerning, uh, and Irving's a big one, and TD Bank is the other. So when there's talk about protests at TD Bank, it relates to that. And there's talk of protests at Irving, though they have clean bathrooms. I found. You're gonna say. There's this downer kind of challenges that we have to face, talk about pollution, et cetera. But they're really, the energy, including, frankly, very much the Climate Solutions event, was about what can we actually do? You know, you look at Germany, which is at a higher latitude than we, and I think it's some enormous number, like 40% of their energy at this point comes from solar. So it's, it's not like we can't do it in this state. But then you have Mr. LePage, who's blocking a solar rebate bill that I would encourage all of you to contact your representative to support. And go ahead. Well, and, and, and those, I mean, it just gets more, the stories continue, it gets more and more complex. We, we had the conversation with Ariel and Crystal, uh, again, from the First Nations up there, and they're in a little bit of a quandary because they can't fully speak out in complete opposition to the tar sands. Uh, business because it employs a lot of First Nations people. And so there's a political challenge for them. I mean, they're opposed to it. They you know, they know it can't be done cleaner, but they also, um, there's a political challenge for them to, you know, realize that their tribes actually benefit from the tar sands. And again, I didn't, I, I may not be as well versed as some, the, again, I've referred to Mr. LePage too many times tonight, um, but he is looking to use uh, increased forestry as a way to help people with, help me, low income heating, that he wants to use public land for that. <laughs> I, I guess to move all of that into the positive and reinforcing the experience of the mining bill kind of stuff, what I've learned in talking to our representatives is they really don't hear that much from people. But when they do, it really it affects them. So that this uh, solar rebate bill has real potential. If those of us who can be the clicktivists uh, and get on our computers and write the notes or pick up the phone, it really, they, they, I can't tell you how many of the senators and representatives have said, we don't hear from anybody, so we don't really, we're not motivated to do it. They can hear from a half dozen or a dozen people, it starts to shift the tide. So I mean, it, it is a place where each one of us can really start to make an impact. To their credit, NRCM has a, a resource link that shows you what the active bills are now, and, and you can make contact. That can help you to make contact. I use it at times. But there's definitely, um, just in the last two years of watching some of this legislative activity, it's been amazing how much the tide has turned with this pub public activism um, around these issues. But it's also been very disappointing as well. But. Pacifying another market. Yeah, Irving's significant concern, and again, they are a major beneficiary to the Energy East pipeline that they're talking about developing. So just a couple things. Our webpage um, is 350main.org. 
Uh, and we're an all, uh, one thing I've learned to say, we're an all-volunteer organization. So uh, they're, they're one, of the, one of the group norms that I've learned with working with this group is assume good intentions. So please assume good intentions. If you don't hear from us on a timely basis, it's just we're a volunteer group. We're always looking for support in whatever way you can provide it. Uh, but a lot of this information that I've shared with you here is in various links on our webpage. Uh, you can always feel free to contact me directly. The information over here, you're welcome uh, to, to look at. Again, the, the April 27th event, where it's the, on the 27th is called Reject and Protect, which is related to the Keystone XL. And we have put a poll out in our most recent email that asked people if they want us to, um, if they want to travel to Washington, D.C. on that date, and or have a solidarity action in Maine. And, and we actually think we're going to do both. Um, you know, we all do what we can do. And like I said, then try to do a little bit more. Uh, but I really appreciate you guys coming out tonight. I'm happy to hang around for any further questions. And I'm glad you're here.